Good morning. Welcome to this webinar. I'm Dave. Hi there. My name is Ivar, and welcome uh, to this case study. We have to say, Dave. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's not. Uh, we have a different team today. It's yeah. the case study, and as you can see, we uh, we are going to talk about the O2 Arena. Yes. In yeah. I'm excited. This yeah. is a really nice venue. More about that later. Uh, and we're going to. With there's a showmatch installed, as you can see behind us. Uh, this is our uh, our touring system. Um, Insulation touring system, I have to say, and uh, we're going to uh, to talk about this why and how and uh, well, everything that happened. And we have three guest speakers. Exactly. So let's introduce them first. Yes. So we have uh, we have Eddie Thomas. He's the vice president of integrated projects. Yeah, and we have uh, Lee Lacey. Uh, Lee Lacey is the facility director of AEG Europe, uh, the owners of the O2 in London. And we have uh, Simon Thomas. And Simon Thomas is a uh, freelance front of house engineer for more than 25 years. Uh, he has a, a lot of experience in the O2 arena and with, uh, with, uh, with mixing and, and everything around uh, concerts. So I'm really excited to hear his story. Okay, so let's get started with the, uh, with the introductions, Ivar. So, uh, so Lee, could you please introduce yourself? Sure, no problem. Hi, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Lee Lacey. I'm the facility director for AG Europe, uh, who are the operator of the O2 and the O2 Arena in Greenwich in uh, South East London. So, okay, thanks, Lee. So for, uh, for others that don't know, can you tell us a little bit more about the venue? Yeah, sure thing. The, uh, the O2 Arena is uh, located in the heart of the O2, which is uh, the world's most popular music, entertainment and uh, leisure venue uh, with a capacity of uh, uh, over 20,000 fans. The arena hosts uh, approximately around uh, 200 events a year uh, and has recently sold its 25 million ticket uh, and quite quite nicely was crowned the venue of the decade at the end of last year. Oh, thanks, Lee. So, uh, so other than concerts, what other type of events are held at this venue? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So, uh, as, you, as you say, most of our uh, music events kind of range from all different music genres, uh, but we also uh, do lots of comedy, uh, sporting events, including the uh, NITO ATP finals. Uh, family events such as Disney on Ice, corporate events, religious events. So yeah, the uh, the scope is quite wide. Great, thanks, thanks. Let's switch over to Eddie first before we continue. Uh, Eddie, can you tell us more about your background and and how 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 was your involvement in, in the O2 arena? Hi, I'm uh, Eddie Thomas. I'm the vice president of uh, Integrated Projects um, for SSE Audio, which is part of the Solitech Group here in the UK. Um, I've been involved in the, uh, the 
uh, since around about 1990 when it uh, first got conceived as the, uh, the Millennium Dome. So uh, I've been on site quite a, quite a few years now in various regenerations of the uh, PAVA systems uh, on the site. Um, we first started off um, with a, um, an integrated solution in 1998, uh, taking us through to the year 2000 when the, uh, the uh, Millennium Dome opened and, and ran for 12 months. Um, I designed and supplied, installed all of the PAVA systems at the time. Um, and then um, post the, the 12 month run um, of the Millennium Dome, um, we refurbished it um, over the, the next 12, 18 months, and we put a, another PAVA system in there to, uh, to cover it while it was being used for exhibitions and demonstrations and, and things like that. But essentially it was just a, a big empty tent at that point. Um, in 2004, I think it was, 2005, we started to get involved in the third generation of the, uh, the, the dome, as it was. Um, and that's really when we started talking to AUG about the development of the, um, the site and also the PAVA system. Um, we went through a tender process, uh, as we all do, and uh, we were fortunate enough to, uh, to win that tender process. Um, so uh, in um, 2005 and six, we were on site putting the, the new system in, um, developing different new softwares and networking and all sorts of aspects of technology that I like to do because I like to push technologies within equipment manufacturers. And um, I think we opened in 2007, uh, just in time. And um, since then, it's been the world's most busiest music venue, very successful. And um, I've been involved with it ever since. We've, we've recently just, in the last three years, been going through an upgrade program at the O2, where we've uh, essentially removed everything that I put in 10 years ago. And now we've upgraded the, the network systems, the amplification, and of course we've moved to the um, Bose uh, solution for the loudspeakers throughout the, uh, the venue. Great, thanks uh, Eddie. Uh, last but not least, Simon. Uh, Simon, over to you. Yeah, well, I guess I'd better introduce myself, really. Um, my name is Simon Thomas. I'm a friend of ours engineer in the live touring scene. I've been doing that for like um, a long time. Let's just say I've been in entertainment for over 40 years, uh, 40 years and um, start starting my life in amateur theatre, uh, working my way through into um, radio. I'm working for the BBC and um, from there discovered rock and roll um, when I was at university. Uh, so I spent three years at university and um, spent more time mixing bands in the student union with a pretty sickly rubbish old PA, uh, an old H&H &H PA, don't laugh at that one. Um, and the rest is kind of history. Uh, ended up at uh, Britannia Row in the 90s um, and Capital Sound Hire and Wigwam. Um, became a monitor engineer for some pretty, you know, pretty, pretty good bands, Moby, um, Lighthouse Family, Machine Head. And just kind of one day went, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to be a front of house engineer, thinking, yeah, that's going to be easy. And stuck to my guns. And um, well, where was that? That was um, kind of around end of the 90s, beginning of the 2000s. So here we are 20 years later. And uh, I've been lucky to um, probably mix some of the biggest female artists I, in the world at the moment. And my, my present act um, is Halsey. Uh, prior to that, I was with Ariana Grande. Thank you, Simon. Uh, interesting track record. Uh, so many years ex of experience. Uh, good to have you here. Uh, question for uh, for Lee. Uh, the, the buzz already is a sound system. Um, and why did you need a new one? Why did you need it to replace your uh, your PA? Yeah, sure. So this all started back in 2013. We undertake undertook a life cycle review of all of our site-wide assets. Uh, it was highlight, highlighted to us that the arena sound system would need to be replaced in the coming years. Uh, and the system was therefore uh, earmarked as one of our key priorities for venue reinvestment. Yeah, and then, and of course, then you need to, to, to start looking for a new PA. How did you, uh, what, was the, what was the starting point? How did you uh, tackle that? So it was kind of twofold, really. Uh, from our global partnerships team, they were aware that we were uh, on the lookout for a, 
for replacing the system and upgrading the system. So they went to the market to, to see if there's any commercial sound manufacturers that were keen to partner with us. Uh, also at the same time, our specialist sound contractor, SSE Audio, uh, they advise us on the uh, latest available technologies uh, that were in the market and, and highlighting any additional benefits to, to the system that we had already. Uh, and off the back of that, both professional uh, showed, showed an interest. Uh, obviously, they were keen to uh, publicise their latest products and uh, after lengthy discussions, uh, they would deem to be the perfect fit for our venue. Right, okay. right. So, Lee, so what, what was it exactly that, uh, that attracted you to Showmatch? Uh, well, it, it was obviously uh, uh, a new, uh, kind of fairly new si system on the market. Uh, in the touring world, you know, there can be some... Uh, a little bit of snobbery around the systems they use and you know we we like to feel that we uh, kind of uh, make changes we like to go stretch boundaries and 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 make new openings so uh, that's something we've done with other other products at the o2 given given uh, manufacturers and suppliers uh, the perfect kind of canvas to to uh, display their products and and we've had very uh, many sex successful uh, partnerships over the years that have been based on that kind of uh, concept. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks, Lee. Thanks. So actually, I was wondering, uh, during the uh, introduction, Simon mentioned he worked with different acts. And uh, I, I'm actually wondering, Simon, what, what kind of acts that you work with? Well, we, you know, going back, let, let's go all the way back. I mean, my first proper band that I um, ever mixed and um, I really had a good time with it was a, a 70s band called Hot Chocolate. That was my first ever band, the proper band, and that's going back right after I left university in 91. And um, very quickly progressed um, to bands like uh, Echo and the Bunnymen. I've already mentioned Moby. I did both monitors and front of house for him at various stages. Um, moved on from there to um, Kylie around 2001. Um, did a lot of um, like the X Factor acts like Lamar, um, um, who else did we do from that stable? Basically all those kind of X Factor things anyway, but Lamar was the main one I did spend about two or three years with him. Um, progressed on that uh, from there, moved on to, uh, uh, what was the last thing? Uh, uh, oh God, going back 10 odd years now, but I did the Jesse J, followed by um, Sam Smith, followed by Ariana Grande, and where I am now into Halsey. So that period was you know, that's nearly 20 years there. There are some nice uh, names uh, to hear, Dave. Right? Indeed. And, and uh, if, you, if you think about the O2, what are the last acts that you mixed in the O2 arena? So, um, um, so the time timeline is, um, you know, uh, people like Kylie Minogue, um, say Sam Smith, Jesse J, um, Ariana Grande. Um, and the last one was Halsey, which was this... Uh, March just gone. Okay, so uh, interesting. But um, uh, so if, if if you need to mix in the in the O2 arena, uh, this is quite a large venue. Eh? What, what, I, I can imagine that there are some challenges over there. So uh, what are the challenges, uh, Simon? Um, I think um, there's a consistency is what the challenge is. So I'm kind of I'm sort of back answering your um, question, if you see what I'm trying to say. I mean, all these venues are challenges because obviously the acoustic nature of them, you know, um, uh, you know, metal, metal roofs, concrete floors, large ambient areas. But the, but the truth is, is that um, the key to all of this is we want to create consistency. So really, that is the, if, if you like, that's the challenge. So Eddie, uh, when did you first became aware of the uh, the show match system? Prior to um, us going down the road with uh, the Bose loudspeaker solution, um, we were in um, taken to Boston to actually listen to the uh, Bose room match. So the O2 originally was going to be a room match installation, um, but we were made aware of a, a new product that was coming along, which was the um, essentially the show match. Um, so we, we had sort of held back the installation and we held back the design until we had the information for the show match because we thought it would be a better fit as a, as a rock and roll touring box as opposed to the, the installed room, room match unit. 
Um, so yeah, basically we um, we we got the specs, we've got the uh, models, um, and working with um, Tom at Bose, we actually created the the Ease model and then the the Bose model model for the arena. Um, and that's when we designed the show match into the system. Uh, we just thought it would be a better fit from a rock and roll perspective, especially as the the O2's got a very varied event base. You know, we've got sports, um, we've got tennis, ice hockey, gymnastics, which are all held in the in the centre area, and then we've got the um, actual um, live music events where you have the stage on one side, and then we're using uh, the in-house. Um, both speakers for production delays so the show match would, would make a better fit for the uh, production delays so talking about talking about the design Eddie could you tell us a bit more about the yeah. system design okay the the O2 design was the first time that um, I'd actually used Bose modeler so um, I'd really only used these previously um, but after a training session with with Tom uh, from Bose um, myself and Paul Todd got into doing the um, final design for the loudspeaker placement within the O2. Um, we based the layout for the loudspeaker positions on what was already installed because we had commercial issues over rigging positions, weights and, and everything else associated with the, the roof nerves. So we tried to keep the um, loudspeaker installation as much as we could in keeping with what was there. Uh, previously. Um, so we settled on having a um, central ring array which consisted of um, um, nine, uh, eight hangs, sorry, um, of eight boxes um, and that covered um, the entire of the, the venue from the central position all the way down to the uh, first row of the seating uh, before the field of play. So we were using the central ring just to cover all the seating area and not the field of play. Um, we then have to consider things like the low frequency elements. Um, so we um, modeled some um, various solutions using the um, RMS218 um, loudspeakers. And we ended up with a configuration of uh, six hangs of four boxes around the center. Um, and they are acoustically steered down so that we get full coverage from level four all the way down to the, uh, the lower rakes. Thank you. Uh, you just uh, told us that you, uh, before a uh, modeler, you used these, um, and this was actually the first time. What was your experience with the Bose modeler software? The Bose modeler software um, is actually really good. Um, I've always used these um, until I got involved with the year two and the Bose show match. And um, yeah, uh, after um, a little bit of training, I did find it yeah, actually really quite good. It's very accurate. Um, but it also gives you a lot more information, a lot more feedback, uh, predicted RT times, all those sort of things which um, you know you have to go away and measure and put into a model uh, under normal circumstances. Um, but it is actually very um, easy to use now, I've got my head around it, and uh, we use it all the time for, for all the designs that we're doing now because it, we find it to be more accurate. Yeah, that's interesting to hear. Um, we just spoke with Simon about challenges in uh, in, in the O2 arena, but I, I can imagine that you also uh, had some challenges for uh, for your model. Uh, what were those challenges? Okay, the um, after we had um, selected Bose as being the preferred loudspeaker solution and been through the design process. Um, obviously, we were upgrading the network and the amplification behind that at the same time. So, um, because the O2 inherently is one of the busiest music venues in the world, it was very difficult to actually get time uh, within the schedule to be able to remove the entire system and put a new system in, bearing in mind it took us about 12 months to put the original system in. So, we had to think about the best way of staging the whole installation process. Um, so what we did is we um, basically ordered up all the network equipment, all the control equipment, the amplification, and we um, set all that up in our lab in uh, our offices in Manchester. And uh, we essentially built the O2 system off-site in Manchester. 
So that enabled us to develop the software, develop the, um, the addressing, all the IPs. Uh, we could virtually run the system up uh, as if it was installed in OT. The only thing we didn't have was loudspeakers, but essentially we had everything else. Um, AG managed to squeeze us a, a two-week window in which to um, in which we could uh, install the the system, which was uh, a very tight window. Uh, bearing in mind what we had to do, because we've got essentially uh, twenty odd equipment racks in the O2, all of which would have to be stripped, um, new systems put in, reconnected up, commissioned, and uh, tested, as well as fire alarm testing and interface testing, and everything else that we had to do within that two week period. Um, but we managed it. We actually um, got all the system up and running in Manchester. Um, the, the client came along, witnessed all the system, witnessed the GUIs, witnessed all the operation of the system. And um, that enabled us to, to pack it all up, move it to, uh, to site at the O2, where we had the speakers waiting for us as well. Um, and then uh, we basically turned off the old system and stripped out all of the old equipment and moved moved all the new stuff in and um, we actually had the central cluster uh, up and running within about eight days so um, it was a long hard days but uh, we actually got it up and running within eight days and uh, the rest of the time was spent really on EQing and uh, getting the system sounding nice and interfacing and testing uh, just to make sure everything was in the right place and working correctly. Yeah, so I actually I have a question for Lee Hever. Yeah. Uh, so this is a quite sophisticated installation, and I'm wondering, uh, Lee, how difficult it was for you to schedule uh, downtime in such a busy venue. Yeah, no, it was almost impossible. Uh, uh, however, the, the team at SSE Audio, uh, they kind of they know the building inside out. They know the way we operate uh, as a business, and they know fully what what our constraints are. Uh, what we did was we broke the refurbishment plan into uh, three phases, uh, basically look, uh, upgrading the network, uh, looking at the amplifiers, and then uh, obviously onto the speaker systems. Uh, the venue is generally quieter in the summer months uh, where the artists tend to play outdoor venues. Uh, so it was essential for us to utilize the, uh, the summer month period that we have uh, uh, and, and ensure that, that, that we utilize those to maximum effect. Uh, so what the uh, guys uh, SSE did in, in their workshop up in Hayward in Manchester it was they built the network uh, and, and pretty much took over the whole of, of, of their facility there. Uh, that, that then allowed them to simulate the system that we had in the arena and then to fully test before they brought it down uh, and installed it at, at the O2 arena. Uh, therefore, we knew that, we, that with the minimal time we had available to us, that uh, a lot of the testing and the proving had, had already been completed. So, so that was really key to, to kind of get in the, the transition done as smoothly as possible. Yeah, yes, yeah exactly. So, so, so what kind of challenges, uh, Lee, are, are unique to, to such an unusual structure? You know, think of the material in the dome. Uh, yes, yes, it's, you know, we, you can look at it in, in a number of ways, really. I mean, it is a, yeah, a, a nice kind of umbrella to, to, to keep you dry uh, in, in, the, in the winter months, but uh, also in the summer months, it can keep you nice and cool. Uh, so fortunately, it doesn't really have an impact at the O2 arena. In, inside the O2 arena, uh, it's fully contained uh, with amazing acoustic properties. So uh, fortunately for, for, for the benefit of, of the Bose system uh, inside the arena, it had no real uh, Real, uh, impact on, on what our thoughts uh, were and how the system was de designed. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, did you had some some experience with, with both and SSE together? What, what was your experience? Uh, well, the experience of working uh, across uh, both the companies was, was excellent right from the outset. Uh, as I said before, SSE fully understand our, our venue, uh, understand how we operate, understand our, our kind of uh, annual diary and, and how that kind of uh, plays out and, and the similarities we have year on year. Uh, that then gave them a, a really good insight into uh, programming their system to ensure the works had minimal impact on our day-to-day -day operations. Uh, Bose obviously had had the product, you know, the, it's a product they're very rightly proud of. Uh, and they provided full support to SSE right the way through. I mean, their, their modular 
uh, was was a, a key uh, part of the success uh, in in the design uh, right from the outset uh, through to the uh, kind of verification of, of of how the sound would would travel in and around the venue. So uh, so both both teams were were working absolutely perfectly together, uh, and and that was really to the benefit of us. Uh, as, as, as you say, the busiest venue in the world, and therefore, uh, with the minimum time, we had to, to turn this around. So, really good to hear that you are happy with the with let's say the system and with also the, both and SSC. So good, good to hear that your experience was uh, is good. I have to say. And and what about your customers? Do you have some some feedback or reactions from your customers? Uh, we've had uh, numerous demo days. Uh, where the commercial uh, market have, have, have come in and, and they've all been very impressed uh, with what they've seen and what they've heard. Uh, both uh, themselves have also been in uh, into the arena and used that to demonstrate uh, to other potential arena uh, uh, upgrades uh, and other uh, venue customers. Uh, each time wow on them to, to such an extent that they've actually won uh, new installation contracts. Uh, and the feedback we've had from the touring community that I mentioned earlier, that's been extremely positive too. Uh, and, and that's been really satisfying because obviously that was a concern uh, from the outset. Yeah, yeah. Well, really good to hear. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Lee. Yeah. So, so, Simon, I'm also wondering what your impressions are of the bow system in the, in the O2 arena. You know what? I was uh, very pleasantly surprised, and I'm not the only engineer that was very pleasantly surprised. I've spoken to a few since, and um, you know, it's you know, obviously I heard a demo of the system before um, in Italy, and um, you know, so I had an idea of what I could expect. Um, but what I also found with the O2 system, what I liked about it more is that it definitely seemed a lot more full range. It, it felt like it went all the way down. Um, I felt it, um, I felt there was enough body in it, which is important. And we had enough, you know, vocal integrity and, um, you know, and, and, the, and the, you know, the high end was good, but the main thing about it, it, it was, it was, you know, really punchy sounding and it, and it was clear. And, um, you know, I think, that's obviously a particularly important thing. I would be interesting to hear, you know, obviously a long line of that system, um, because I think there it's what is it, eight, uh, six or eight boxes per hang, something like that. So, um, and to be honest, yeah, it was. Um, I thought it was it was quite impressive. I didn't have to do much EQ. Or we actually, I think we had bypassed all the EQ, and we just did a little bit of shaping. Nothing, nothing serious and um and just time aligned it and that was it um and it well interesting comment was that um the tour accountant who was actually a tour manager as well so uh, went up there and he was walking around came back down he said you know what i'm really surprised how good that sounded it, it was good and um, i say i've had a couple of other engineers that have said they felt it was actually really good too so um yeah um i, I would say i was impressed with it yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, Simon. So, uh, so now you have, you know, if you have such a high quality system in this venue, how much of an advantage is it to have this permanently installed in uh, in this venue? Oh, it's absolutely important to have a high quality install in the venue. Um, you know, especially um, with with delay situations, because you know, with the nature of a um, you know a pop tour or any tour now, time is of, of the essence, and uh, you know there isn't always time to spend time putting delays in and things like that. It's hard enough getting the actual PA, you know, left, right and side hangs, you know, these days to to be able to be ready for sound check. But also, you know, with the variety of tours that everybody's doing now that go from small venues to larger venues, it's not really practical to be carrying lots of delays. So, yeah, I mean, it's really, really important to have um, something, um, definitely delays that are of good quality and permanently installed. And saying that, I can see, um, you know, as, as time goes by and, you know, especially with the, the current um, climate, I can see more and more uh, installs um, for the whole system, actually, as we move forward. You know, obviously, we're seeing that in um, some of the smaller venues throughout um, the UK and Europe. But I can see that surely um, a bit by bit moving into a lot bigger venues. So... Um, and, you know, and obviously, you know, if the systems, 
um, good, high quality, then yeah, why not? Why I think it you know makes everybody's day easier. Yeah. Yeah, and and um, uh, the, the artists are bringing their own system for front PA. Let's say uh, most of the time we're talking about so much for the distribution of the of the O2 Arena. Um, are there some challenges between matching those two uh, systems together? Um, I think, to be honest with that that one is. It all comes down to, I mean, I've got to be careful how I word this. It, all, it does all come down to, you know, EQ and shaping. But, you know, the way I operate, I can only say from my perspective, because I'm not uh, a person that particularly um, takes a lot of information out of a PA system, I will, you know, adjust the bands, you know, the high, the mids, the lows, just to get a, a tonal shape. Then as long as I've got, that control with any system i've always found with my experience i can go from virtually any system and it will be pretty close because i'm, I'm absolutely confident the mix coming off my console is good i very rarely have to change what comes off my console what i'm dealing with is the speaker system in the venue so in, in, all, in all fairness you know if it's a well set up system which i can get control of and the software is good then to be honest it's not really um personally a massive challenge to, to, to me personally um, as I say I think it's about control if we've got control it, it, it it's it's not that difficult I think where we might run into problems if we don't have that control and the system's locked out and you know it's been over EQ you know timeline wrong well obviously that is um, well, that is definitely a challenge and I've obviously been into environments before where that has happened and that is the big challenge getting the time right and getting the tone right but if we have all the control you know i don't it's not a challenge yeah yeah interesting yeah um, um another thing if if uh, you're the expert uh, you you did a lot of tours already if you compare the o2 system with other venues what's your opinion about that um i would say um it, I, I, no, I think it is very comparable in all, in all fairness. Definitely is a delay system. It's definitely comparable for sure. Um, you know, um, it's um, you know, it's a big venue and you've got good coverage up there um, at the back of the arena, up in the gods as we would call them in the theatre days. Um, so absolutely it's com comparable. Um, I think that, uh, as, as, I was trying to say, as we're saying, you know, a lot of these we're starting to see more and more uh, of this happening in stalls and more and more things like this and delays. So um, I would say, obviously, I'm more used to this in America. In the UK, it's only sort of started in, I've noticed, to come online more so in the sort of last five years before delays weren't there. So um, it's definitely comparable to a lot of the venues that I've uh, worked in abroad and it seems to be comparable to the the few that i know of in the uk for sure oh nice to hear really yeah. nice to hear yes so um i have i have a question for eddie so eddie if you uh if you look back on this project eh, it's, it's a big project uh, how did you find you know working with bose on such a large you know project for the o2 arena working with bose has actually been a pleasure because um we've always been able to plan our requirements with them. Um, and because of that planning process we went through with the O2 and with, with subsequent projects, we've used those arena match, show match on. Um, we can plan deliveries, we can plan scheduled deliveries, and um, we've, we've had no, no real issues with, with getting hold of equipment. It's always been there and available for us um, at quite short uh, times, which is, uh, which is always a good thing. Right. So, so I'm also wondering what your what your impressions are of the uh, of the system performance. The system that's now installed in the O2 using the Bose Showmatch speakers, uh, performance-wise, is excellent. Um, we've had lots of good comments from visiting production companies and sound companies. Um, it is extensively used for just about every event now that goes through the O2. So if you're up at level four, um, then you will actually be listening more to the Bose Showmatch system than you would be to the 
the front of house system. Okay. Right. Yes. So I'm, I'm curious, actually, so if we dive a bit deeper, eh, could you explain a bit more about the bow system uh, in, in the arena and what it's, what it's used for? The system that's installed in the O2 is actually um, a PAVA system or public address and voice alarm system. So not only is it used for um, reinforcement for the events such as tennis, uh, ice hockey, gymnastics and sports, um, but it's also used as the production um, reinforcement um, delay system for uh, visiting um, sound companies and productions. Um, also, essentially, it is part of the voice alarm system. So it is connected directly to the phylum system. Um, it operates redundantly. We have A and B loudspeaker circuits throughout the building. We have A and B uh, amplifier circuits throughout the building and we also run an A and B uh, redundant um, star topology network um, using uh, fire rated fibre. All the cables associated with loudspeakers are all fire rated um, throughout the building um, so that we can comply with all the local regulations and standards for voice alarm systems. Wow. That's, that's more than just a uh, sound system, a delay system. Great. And, and from a technical, technical uh, perspective, uh, Eddie, uh, how is the Bose system used during the concerts? Uh, when a production company um, comes in with the uh, sound contractor, um, they usually provide us with um, zero dB feed, uh, one, two, three, or even four feeds. Um, so we can actually um, define which loudspeakers they want to use within the arena on the production delays. Um, there's four production delays in total. Um, you have two outers and two inners that, that create um, the delay effect for the um, level four in the bowl. Uh, we also have um, two left and right side hangs, which um, give you um, reinforcement in the sort of upper 10 rows of the, the higher level side uh, seating rakes. Um, and what we do is we take those feeds from the uh, production company. We can either take zero dB analog audio, which plugs into a, a local patch bay, um, or we can take a, a Dante feed, which can be then routed via our Dante network um, onto the uh, speakers. We, we, we can offer the guys uh, from the sound uh, company um, all the facilities to be able to set the delays up themselves and EQ the system themselves. Um, or we can do that. We have an engineer on site for every event so that we can assist them with that. Seems that you thought about everything, if, uh, if I hear this. Um, and, and do you have some reactions from the, the, the visiting tours? We've had some very good positive reaction from the visiting production engineers and the sound engineers um, with the Bose Schirmwrench system. Um, they're quite impressed with the coverage and the level that we get uh, from the system at, uh, at level four and um, how smooth and easy it is to equalize. Um, they don't tend to have to do too much to it to make it sound nice. Okay. Thanks, Eddie. So, uh, so Lee, we just heard fr from Eddie that uh, the system is pretty easy to tune. And I'm actually wondering if a production team, come or, you know, a production team comes in, do they use the bow system? They use parts of the system. So uh, if you kind of imagine uh, a standard arena, at one end of the arena, you'll have the stage uh, with rigging over the stage with the uh, majority of the sound system. Uh, because the, the O2 arena is quite a large venue, uh, then the opposite end to the stage, we would have our own uh, delay speakers. So they tend to uh, tie into our delay speakers to make sure that the uh, the visitors at the, at the back end of the arena get just as good uh, sound quality as those at the front of the arena. So uh, yeah, we, we do encourage all, all tours, uh, especially with a full bowl, to uh, to link into the to the delay speakers, so that they're uh, fully utilised. Okay, and, and and now we're talking about concerts and, and that kind of events, but I can imagine that there are also other events. Is the system then being used? Yeah, yeah, all all, all the time. So uh, where where there are uh, other events, uh, other than kind of the, the your standard uh, music events where your tours bring their own uh, systems in, uh, the other uh, kind of events they will use our full system. Okay, thanks. thanks. So um, some time uh, back, um, Eddie spoke about the uh, you know evacuation 
part of it. And is how is the system used as an evacuation system? Yes, yes, and that's and that's key to uh, how we uh, design the whole system as well. Uh, obviously, uh, part of the PABA ha comes with its own uh, kind of regulations that, that need to be adhered to and, and complied with. Uh, so we, we utilise that fully throughout the arena uh, and the, the outside the arena as well, the venue. So uh, what we're looking to do, hopefully, in the, in the coming years, is to expand uh, from the arena outside. Uh, so that the whole of the O2 will be uh, full of uh, both product. Okay, right. So if you look uh, back, uh, Lee, so uh, with the old system, you have the new system. How much of an of an improvement is the new system compared to the old one? It's, I, I think it's been really noticeable, uh, a huge improvement. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've been, just been so pleased with the decision we made to, to go to go with both. Uh, obviously, uh, systems uh, change and evolve and, and improve o over time uh, we, we you know we, we did have some concerns uh, as we as we said from the outset it, it was kind of a system that wasn't really known to us uh, but yeah we've it's just been uh, amazing improvements and and really pleased with how it's uh, uh, worked out for us nice and, and now i'm also curious what's your personal opinion of the sound well as I kind of mentioned earlier, uh, using the Bose modeler, uh, that's enabled us to, to, you know, have full ability uh, to uh, to ensure that the whole arena sound has been fully modelled. Uh, the the uh, coverage is comprehensive, uh, and I just think the uh, the sound from the show match speakers that we have is amazing, uh, and the audio coverage throughout the arena is just ideal. I mean, you know, it's just a a perfect. It's been a perfect partnership for us. Uh, and the product is, is just lived up to all expectations. Really nice to hear, uh, Lee. Um, Eddie spoke already a bit about the installation, but I can imagine it's such a busy uh, venue. How did you schedule that that upgrade? It has been a phased approach uh, in the upgrade. So obviously, if it was a, if it's a new venue, uh, then it will be a lot slicker. We've had to take a phased approach. We've had to upgrade the uh, the network system first. Uh, we followed that through with with like the uh, ensuring that the amplifiers and and uh, uh, the speakers were all compatible and, and and ensuring that everything ran ran smoothly. So uh, it's just putting a lot of thought, a lot of planning into how that phased approach would work. Obviously, if it w we start from scratch, then it would have been a, a far easier process. But uh, you know, everyone worked together, everyone collaborated, and uh, yeah, you know we. We found the time, we found the uh, the product, and we found the right right team to install it. So it's it's, it's been a, a really good uh, really good decision, uh, and the fact that the 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 business backed us with with the funding, it, you know, we've been really pleased, and hopefully, you've got a system now to see us through for many years. Yeah, <clears throat> nice. Thanks. Thanks, Lee. So uh, so Simon, so um, if you look at you know a tour like Halsey. You know where you carry a lot of um, um, touring systems with you. How do uh, you know? Do you generally use the uh, the system for, uh, for for your delays? Yeah. No. I mean, basically, um, you know, obviously, uh, especially like the last tour we did with Halsey. This is actually a very good example because of the nature of that tour. We were going from, you know, some smaller venues to some you know, which were a couple of thousand in Europe and then all the way up to the O2. So you can imagine there's extremes of um, shows to do. Um, so the idea of us carrying delays and things like that was just not a practical thing. And to be honest, not so, though, you know, to be honest with most of the good quality line arrays today, you know, you can kind of kind of get away with it. You know, it's probably not the word I should be using, but, um, you know, obviously then if it's a good house system to tie into, then why not? To be honest, tying into a good house system, in some respects, is making um, our day easier. But also, in a lot of other respects, it's usually because if it's a good install, you know, which the uh, you know O2 is a good install, it's got good coverage, you know, um, it's um, a very full sounding rig, it's got plenty of punch. Then, then it'd be, I'd be foolish not to uh, patch into that because. Um, yeah, as I say, it's been situated and put in place and mapped in a way that um, gives us the coverage we need it there and, uh, you know, gives a good um, 
supplement to the uh, touring system. Thanks, Simon. So uh, I have another question for you. Uh, you're very well known for uh, for mixing female pop vocalists. So I, I'm really curious to see what your approach is. Yeah, right. Okay. I mean, obviously, the challenge with um, uh, I, I say with female vocalists is, is the fact that um, the frequency range of the vocal um, quite often sits in all those areas, like you know the snare drum, guitars in particular. And, and and you know so, and, and some of the key sets sort of higher key sounds and you know obviously the key the key to you know a uh, female vocal is that we need to be, be able obviously to hear that you know the, that high mid but also we've got to also hear the low mid to the vocal and the depth of the vocal because if we don't we end up with this kind of scooped out sound and the vocal ends up being you know taken over by things like snare and guitar so from my perspective, working with female vocals, key is obviously to get that vocal sounding as big and as warm as possible. And then with other things, probably doing things that are to sculpture around it. Um, you know, for example, I will, with a snare drum, I'll make it sound a bit darker and duller and, uh, you know, push it into the low mids more. So there's more space in the higher mids for the vocal to breathe, for example. And then, you know, for example, I might, you know, I'll just took guitars as an example, you know, I'll just took them either side of the vocal with a bit of an image. So there's a bit of space for the vocal to come through. So, you know, um, it's about creating space. That's the bottom line. And, uh, you know, one of the tricks I, you know, one of the tricks I do is that I um, treat a PA system as two PA systems. And that's another whole subject, um, but I can briefly go in over it. Remember, I, I was saying, can I say this? Saying earlier, we were talking about, um, uh, you know, uh, um, how how to make two systems fit together, the delay system and the main system with two different brands. And I said I don't EQ much. Well, that is key to this with female artists. You've got to keep the, the PA as flat and as round as possible to keep the band sounding as round and as fat as possible. And then I will feed the vocal into a stem or, or a subgroup and on that subgroup i will treat that as another pa system but that will be all the eq that the crazy eq that needs to be done to keep that vocal stable will be done in that stem not in the pa um, so that's how i do it that's how i create the space i'm sure there's other ways we, that it can be done but I found from experience that is by far the best way to approach the the topic of, of, of female vocals because they can be very very dynamic, and that's the other thing about them, you know. And it's it's about you know sometimes they might sing quiet, sometimes they might sing loud, but it's it's you know, um, and you have to learn to control that to keep it all together. Hence why I use the stem for a lot of my processing for a vocal to leave the PA alone. Okay, and if you talk about the LC tour, uh, that's I've heard that that's an let's say extremely uh, uh, varied style of, of all kind of music. What challenges uh, gives you that with with tuning a PA system? Right, uh, that's uh, you know I I, sh I should have known you were going to ask that one. Um, it, it, it's it, it's extreme to say the least. It's um, I would have said the last tour was it, it ranged from what I call regular pop, electro pop, to metal. That that was pretty much it. You know, you couldn't get more extreme of um, sounds coming at you from from the stage. So you now, in regards to PA, um, we had uh, presets. Uh, you know, for certain songs. So you know, obviously, what we didn't want is. Um, uh, a, a pop show to sound like a metal show if that makes sense we need still it's still you know it's still it's still more of a a pop show but it's a it's a very diverse pop show so we obviously those songs that exist of hers we couldn't have them sounding like a metal song in the same way we couldn't have a metal song sounding like a pop song so we had to have presets uh, that's how we did it so we would uh, you know we'd have presets in our uh, lake um, con controllers uh, we would set those presets up and we would literally just recall an overlay for for um, for you know the different styles of song within the set 
obviously I had scenes in the console where we'd obviously do stuff there, but even, you know, we're doing that, we still need to tune the PA slightly different for what I call, you know, for a more sort of, um, sort of thrashy sounding song. You obviously don't need as much high mid, you obviously don't need as much as much of the sort of four or five Ks, um, three, four, five Ks. So we have filters in there, which we would um, overlay for those kind of songs. And then for the more sort of, what I call generic pop songs, a lot of that more of that information was put back in. So that, that's how we did it. Thank you, Simon. Uh, really interesting to uh, to hear uh, all your experience uh, within the uh, O2 arena, but also, of course, with, with everything that you have done. So thank you. Yeah, I, I agree, Evan. This is a super interesting yeah. story today. <laughs> so, uh, Bara, this brings us to the end of the, uh, the O2 case study for today. Yeah. We would really like to thank uh, Lee, Simon and Eddie for their valuable insights and the story that they shared with us today. Yeah. And uh, please feel free if you have any questions left, uh, just send us an email. Uh, you will. We have, a, we have a handout available. You will find our email address uh, in the handout. So yes. please feel free. And, and by the way, in the meantime, uh, Ifar is sharing some nice pictures on the background. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, there was some nice pictures from the installation. Eh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, we took some pictures. So uh, first of all, Lee, uh, thank you for uh, attending this uh, case study. And of course, uh, for sharing all your insights. Uh, no problem at all. No, you're welcome. Yeah, so Eddie, also for you, a big thank you for sharing your uh, your uh, your insights today. And uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, thank you for listening and um, hope to see you with you too soon. And of course, Simon, thank you as well for your valuable insights. Uh, really appreciate it. Well, guys, uh, thanks for having me. It was good to have a chat today about the, the system and... Um, I'm sure we'll catch up soon. Okay, thanks. So, also, I uh, thank you for everybody that attended uh, us yeah. for this uh, for this case study today, Ivor. We are really looking forward to see you uh, next time in yeah. one of our next future webinars. Yes. So for now, goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, stay and safe. Stay safe.